And um, simply, um, I agree with you in terms of the overwhelming um, repression and kind of difficulty of making um, a challenge to the ultimate um, uh, paradigm, so to speak. But you did have McTain and McVeigh and people like that who did from the beginning challenge me. And I'm wondering why do you think it was so difficult for them to maintain any kind of credibility? Uh, yeah, I mean, at, uh, there, there were. There was Anderson, uh, there was McVeigh, um, and indeed inside Indonesia, there were some brave voices, even during the New Order, who in the interstices and you know here and there underground often secretly or through fictional works were speaking out and uh, and, and resisting um, I think that there, there were that it's not that there was nobody saying anything there were in fact solidarity groups there were international solidarity groups but if one th goes back to 1965 1966 and 67 overwhelmingly um, the uh, the, the media, the uh, international organizations, the, um, the, the most powerful governments and most academics and most journalists were on the same page. Even the, uh, the French Communist Party newspaper was essentially saying, well, you know, this was a, it, you know, a terrible thing, but it was people running amok. And so the, the there was this a kind of a broad acceptance of, um, of, of this singular point of view. It wasn't very well explored. I would say that I don't know what the excuse of the French communists was, but the excuse of all the others was that um, <coughs> they uh, simply were wrapped up in an anti-communist um, time, in an anti-communist uh, worldview, which seemed to make this kind of thing not only justifiable, but actually good news. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, there were, certainly there were other voices, but they really were uh, up against an awfully, an awfully uh, powerful Oops. counter. Uh, but to, to, you write about this and you do too, the Cornell paper, which actually tried to, to uh, say that it wasn't an uprising of uh, hatred and running amok for the, led to these mass killings, that paper was deliberately debunked by the U.S. government by publishing the coup that backfired mm, right. in order to counter that. Even though it was still a classified document, they were handing it out in the embassy. And I actually talked to the woman who wrote it, and she confirmed that it was all designed to say that Anderson got it all wrong. And he was banned to go back to Indonesia. Right. So they did everything to undermine any other view than the official. Right. Another, and the U.S. was involved in that, too. Right. Another interesting aspect of that is that the, the United States government was working hand in glove with the Indonesian military and some civilian authorities to the same end. So if you look at the early uh, rebuttals by the Indonesian military, uh, the, 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 official, the, new, the early official histories, they say in their prefatory remarks, this was essentially written in order to refute Anderson and McVeigh. Um, and then the first editions are written in English, so they're, they're designed for an international audience. Um, academics are, you know, are sometimes heroes, but in this case, academics were complicit mm. in the US government's uh, campaign. <coughs> there were some who don't necessarily need to be outed right here. You could just read people's books to find out who they are, but they were uh, complicit in distributing this material and making it available in, in Jakarta. So, how could a country, right, with the one of the largest communist party in a short time period, conducted a mass popular killing, like what you said, based on popular anger? And I agree with you that it, I mean, language and propaganda played a very important role in it. Um, but I wonder if it's the, the anti-communist propaganda was actually rooted way back beyond uh, Cold War and through to the colonial period. In 1920, 26, 27, the Dutch government executed 3,000 communists, sent uh, 
you know, thousands of communists to the Gul Island, and then set a Zaman German Normal, which is an, a very, really anti-communist propaganda is within the psyche of the popular. Mm -hmm. So while perhaps now we're living in a Latin communism, the communist threat, maybe at the period, I wonder if you could respond to this, before 1965, people were actually living in a Latin anti-communist threat. That when John said that, you know, people were reluctantly say that, okay, well, we are a, we are big here in Surakarta Communist Party. It's impossible for us to be destroyed. There is this feeling of, you know, perhaps always the anti-communist, uh, sorry, anti-communist angst, perhaps. Angst. Okay. You <laughs> want to say something with you? Um, yeah, I guess, <clears throat> you know, one thing that, that's noticeable about the kind of democracy period in the sort of six years before 65 is how the anti-communist literature was, was very sparse. It wasn't al really allowed because it would disrupt national unity. And so there was this sort of break with that tradition of anti-communism. Masjumi was banned and must, you know, Masjumi couldn't. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of, in the immediate period, there, there was a lessening of the anti-communist propaganda. And then all of a sudden in October, you get this explosion of it. And even Parita Yuda and Agatan uh, Persanjata, in from the time they start in early 65 up until September, you don't, you, you're reading it, you don't really see like they're, it's anti PKI. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of read between the lines to see that it's actually anti PKI. So there was, the, there was that break there. But yeah, there's a long term continuity there. And the propaganda, as I see it, the, one of the chapters of the book is just on the propaganda and it's just sort of to document all the different themes and articles and the progress of the propaganda. And it was one of the most unpleasant chapters to write. And uh, But actually, I, I think it's a useful compendium in one place of all of these, these, the story about this propaganda, because I didn't see it already. But I see it more as an incitement, as Jeff was saying, rather than what is responsible for the killing. That is like, people didn't read the propaganda and then say, oh, I'm going to go out and kill, <coughs> right? Because it took the army to organize them. But it sort of, it really helped, it facilitated it. Well, could I, could I have one thing to that, sir? I'm not sure I completely agree with you, uh, but I do think about the 1920s, because I think that in the 1920s, in fact, the 1920s, even after the crushing of the communists, by the 1940s, the Communist Party is back again. And actually, you know, there are very few nationalists around, apart, from, you know, there are very few serious nationalists who don't in some way think that, um, that imperialism is bad, that socialism is a good idea, that communism is an acceptable ideology. I think the turning point is Madiun in 1948. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's significant, I think, that in, you, no doubt you came across this in your chapter on the yeah. propaganda. One of the things that is deliberately invoked in 1965 as a way of stirring up people's anger is the, the, the memory of the betrayal and the treachery of the Communist Party at Madiun in September 1948. A, a kind of a fake history of its own, but one which is very, very consciously manipulated you see it in graffiti in 1965, Remember Madiun. You see it in books and in newspapers. And significantly, you see it in the psychological warfare planning of the British and the Americans. Make sure to tie this action back to 1940, to Madiun, as a way of tarnishing the name of the PKI by connecting this with that earlier treachery. So I think that's the, the critical turning point. Great. Uh, Margo, and then so, Margo. Yes, my question for John is, what did Pabronto have to say about Sham and Aided, and did mm. he express any bitterness towards them? And for Jeff, uh, what do you make of the allegations against the Chinese as far as their involvement? Yeah, so Pabronto, I don't think, ever met um, Sham. Um, he knew Pat Carter, but no, he, he never s spoke to me about Sham. The person he spoke about was the local sp special bureau fellow who sort of succeeded Pat Carto. And that person was alive, and I, his name is Joseph Rabidi. He's since passed away. But um, I met him several times and pleaded with him to <laughs> please talk. 
And um, he gave me all sorts of excuses, but essentially he didn't want to re reveal party secrets. And that's the way he put it. Even though another friend of mine who had been in the Special Bureau came to him and said, look, the Special Bureau is over with. The, <laughs> you, you can, you don't, you're free to speak. And, um, he, he wouldn't say anything. Um, and part of it, I think, is this man, Yosef Rubidi, felt responsible for the defeat. And um, I think Pat Bronto felt, um, you know, uh, felt like the Special Bureau had screwed up, had really screwed up. But he remained, I think, you know, he, w he wasn't like anti-communist and he, he wasn't like turned against the party and he still, and he, he didn't, in this effort was actually a kind of clever way for him to keep trying to organize uh, people, not for you know, the, par the party or anything, but just to you know, keep active <laughs> and uh, uh, to, so. On the question of Chinese, you mean <coughs> Beijing, you don't mean Chinese Indonesians involvement. I mean allegations that Aidit met with with, with Mao. Mao. Okay, yeah. So um, I think so. There's one article in particular, one uh, which which addresses this meeting between Aidit and uh, and Mao in 1965, August 1965, which suggests that um, in the course of that conversation, Aidit revealed the PKI's plan to act preemptive, preemptively against the military, thereby ostensibly proving that the PKI was in fact the mastermind of, of the uh, October 30th movement. I think that the, the, the evidence that's presented in, in that is far from definitive. Even the quotation it is open to myriad interpretations. Uh, w at the very most, what it might reveal is what John has already argued, which is that alone among, er, possibly alone within the PKI, I did, may have been party to this and may in fact have been helping to plan it. But it does not show anything about the PKI as a party. Um, and in fact, even the quotation doesn't necessarily prove the argument about I did. Um, there is one thing which is quite interesting to note, and that is again going back to the psychological warfare campaign. Uh, at the time, in, in October and November, when these stories about Chinese complicity began to circulate, um, within the, the, the secret cables of the British and the, uh, the American and the German, various other secret cables, they were saying, really, there's no evidence. We don't actually believe that the Chinese were behind this. Nevertheless, they developed as part of their side, their <coughs> side war campaign and their propaganda campaign for international consumption the story that the Chinese were behind. This was Chai Coms. Yeah, that, that, that the Chai Coms, <laughs> Chinese communists, were in fact, uh, they, to, let's spread the story that the Chinese communists were in fact behind this. This serves the dual purpose of sullying the reputation of Sukarno, mm -hmm. of the PKI, while also taking a poke um, at the Chinese communists and, and even getting scoring a few points um, in Vietnam, which is happening uh, simultaneously. So you see this, it, there are two things in these documents. On the one hand, uh, um, an, a, a revelation that they, they think that this allegation lacks credibility, but on the other hand, a willingness and enthusiasm for spreading this news because they believe it will damage the reputation of Sukarno and the PKI, and, and it will hasten the demise of Sukarno and the PKI. John, do you want to add anything on that? Or should um, no, Great. So you're next, and then Muscle. Yeah, following up on the Chinese question, uh, how much of the uh, violence was uh, really direct, uh, was directed towards ethnic hatred of, uh, of, of the Chinese community in, in in the region? Number one, number two, I seem to recall that uh, boats had been sent by the government of China to evacuate uh, Chinese ethnic Chinese uh, from yeah. Indonesia, and the third. The third point is the question about the, the role of the uh, PKI in terms of it being a mass part, uh, striving to be a mass party as as opposed to being a, uh, a party 
uh, Communist Party that was directed towards protecting, being able to protect itself and th therefore not being able to protect its own members because they had a struck, had striven, strove to be a mass party. Uh, that's not the, the whole question of the ideology, ideolo their own ideological question. Um, I'll do with the last one, maybe you can talk okay. about the Chinese and the Asian. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, the, the first chapter of my, this book manuscript is about PKI strategy, especially during the guided democracy period, and confronting the army's strategy at the same time to build up the territorial command. So the PKI's strategy in dealing with the army was actually to, you know, work within the army. And so during these six years as the army was becoming more powerful uh, from 59 to 65, more rooted in the society with what's called the territorial command. Um, the quorum, uh, codons, codons, codons. Um, the PKI isn't saying, look, this is a terrible idea. Don't do this, you know. And they're just thinking, well, at some point we can take this over. With, with our supporters. And their idea was to gain more supporters within the army. And so they had to do that clandestinely, um, but it was their strategy. And, so, and it worked at local areas where they would get military personnel to protect their demonstrations. To, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes organizing, the hidden side of the history of the PKI, you know, it, that you don't write just from the publications is you know, these kinds of activities of getting help from police officers as well as military officers. So would you say it was a diluted strategy? Well, at the time it made sense and it was very effective. <laughs> uh, so it's well, hard it to see, you know, it's it wasn't very effective. It, it, ultimately it wasn't, but it made sense. They already had all of these people in the army who, especially in central Java, who supported them. And it's like, they, it's, it's, it's always the question for a party that wants to be revolutionary is if you're going to really challenge the status quo, if you're going to challenge property in, in, um, interest, then you're going to have to face the coercion that they, these property interests can mobilize against you. And there's never a good answer there. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but that's... Yeah, but it is true that certainly there there was subsequently been the critique of the party that yeah. while you spread too far too quickly, you were more interested in increasing members and not increasing the kind of revolutionary consciousness and so on. And I mean, to a degree, that's a valid criticism. But uh, who who would have known that before the catastrophe? I'm not sure. Um, let me just say a, a few things about the question, the, your first two questions about the ethnic Chinese. I think uh, one of the big kind of misunderstandings about the violence in 1965 was that it was, uh, and this is a sort of a New York Times, with apologies to any New York Times people here, uh, kind of a, partly the responsibility of the New York Times is that this was somehow an ethnic. Who's responsible for that? Yeah. <laughs> but this was a, uh, an ethnic, primarily, uh, uh, violence driven by ethnic hatred. Um, now, there is no shortage of, of uh, animosity toward and, and uh, discrimination uh, against <coughs> ethnic Chinese. But uh, the, uh, if, if one looks at the violence in 1965-66, overwhelmingly it was not driven by ethnicity or ethnic, ethnic hatred, it was driven by political identity. Now, were Chinese people, ethnic Chinese, Chinese Indonesians targeted? Yes, indeed, they were. Particularly in certain cities and towns where, after 1959, most had been forced to move because they were no longer allowed to operate and live in the countryside. So we tend to know a lot about them because we knew about what was happening in the city. But whether the, the saying that there were ethnic Chinese targeted is different than saying that they were targeted because of their ethnicity. Here one has to look carefully at what the political identity, uh, what the, the logic of their targeting was. And I would argue that overwhelmingly ethnic Chinese were targeted because of their political beliefs. Ch ethnic Chinese, at two, and not all, certainly, but great number of ethnic Chinese had by 1965 become sympathetic to the left. 
they had joined not so much the PKI, but a, a Chinese uh, uh, organization that was quite left-wing and sy sympathetic to Sukarno, a kind of left nationalist organization called Perki. It was because of those political affiliations that they were targeted in 1965. Um, now, uh, it is true, nevertheless, that ethnic Chinese felt that they, uh, if you look at the photographs, you can find that in certain areas, in Pontianak, in Maidan, there are a significant number of ethnic Chinese who were in detention. And there was fear on the part of ethnic Chinese in those areas. And it was they, overwhelmingly, who uh, took the offer of evacuation on Chinese vessels. And, and this is probably the one act of, of solidarity that uh, one found in the aftermath of the violence of 65, certainly nothing from the Soviets, nothing from the French communists, nothing from anybody else. The one thing that happened was the Chinese helped to evacuate some Chinese uh, uh, Indonesians. Uh, but that does not mean that the violence was driven by ethnic hatred. One, one, no, one so addition to that. In Surakarta, the Chinese <coughs> business district was attacked and burned down soon after the Arpekade troops arrived. And that, I think, was largely just in order to get money mm -hmm. for the militias as they were going to begin their operations. Yeah. And so the people, the Chinese merchants, were not sort of rounded up and arrested and so forth. It was just, there was yeah. discrimination, but it was really just a money-making sort of operation <laughs> to fund this, this militia. So I that's think that's absolutely right. Yeah. And it happened in Samaran, and it happened in other places. There was a gathering of money, but also a kind of extortion. So I was speaking earlier about logistics, uh, warehouses, trucks, and so oh, yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that happened was that the military said, well, we could arrest you, or you could give us your warehouse and your 10 trucks. And so where did the, all those trucks come from in certain areas? They weren't all military trucks. They were trucks owned by Chinese businessmen who were in the cement industry or in the, the construction industry. And the warehouses were Chinese uh, uh, warehouses. So there was extortion going on, but that, that didn't mean that uh, those were not necessarily the primary targets because of their ethnicity. They were there, and they had resources available that were then used in the, in the killing and the detention. That's good. Uh, with the huge uh, scale of mass killing and mass integration at the time, uh, totally annihilation of the PTI. So what is the ultimate goal of the Suharto regime to do that? So, for example, if I uh, use the uh, Sumpeterian theory about the creative destruction, so, first of all, they have to de uh, destruct something, destruction of the, uh, something already <coughs> exists in order to build something new. So, uh, so what is actually uh, with the huge support of the international mass media, international government to support Sohato regime when they and angrily of the PKI? <laughs> what is the ultimate goal? Um, you're going to take oh, a stab okay. at I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll, I'll be the fall guy here yeah, and uh, <laughs> give an answer that Jeff can um, contradict or modify in some way. Um, you, know, you know, as Jeff was saying before about these sort of um, the way in which international aid from the United States was staggered as proof came in that the PKI was being destroyed. Um, one element that explains the killing, in part, is that um, Suharto's group, as they're thinking about the destruction of the PKI, and they want to be sure that it never reorganizes again, um, they're also thinking that they need to prove to the United States that they are deserving of more money. Mm. And they, they, there's a one cable from the U.S. Embassy, which says, you know, a Representative Suharto came and essentially said, how much are these dead bodies worth to you? How much are you going to give us? So I think, you know, I, it's, it's impressionistic evidence. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but I think that part of it, to, as proof to the United States, that, and, and the United States is saying, that's great. And then they say, oh, 
okay, well, let's keep doing it, you know. And so I think in many cases the military officers were, were not ready to kill the PKI, especially when the killing involved these just massacres, you know, taking people out of detention, killing them, and then putting them in mass graves. It was really a shameful kind of business for them. But they thought these are our orders, and so it, all, it only takes some orders from you know Suharto's, Suharto's group. So that's part of it. But the other the other thing, what I was saying too, is about calling the prison population. I think what, what in just following up on this, one of the one of the really striking things about the cables in the early in the first few weeks after the the coup is that the the CIA and the the. Uh, State Department and so on are saying there is a danger that the army will not take advantage of this opportunity to wipe out the PKI. They see it as a problem that the army may not seize the day and wipe the floor with the PKI. So they need to be encouraged and and pushed. So if one takes that as you know part of of the, the logic of the situation. The question is not simply, as John I think is suggesting, it's not simply what is the purpose of the Suharto regime or of Suharto. It's what is the purpose of the United States and what is the purpose of the United Kingdom in encouraging uh, mass killing. So at some point these become, uh, they, they come together. Uh, one could say that the purpose is a counter-revolutionary purpose. Uh, they actually genuinely believe that the Communist Party and Sukarno represent a threat to a, a, a world system that they hope to dominate. Remember, 1965 is, you know, October 1965 is six months after uh, the United States begins its overt involvement in Vietnam with Operation Rolling Thunder. This is the very height of U.S. anxiety over the possibility, which they considered very real, that communists will take over throughout Southeast Asia. It's not just an ideological concern, it's a concern about resources, control of nickel and oil and, and so on. It's, a, it's a, a, a major worry in 1965 that the United States and its allies and its entire approach to the world political economy is going to fail. And that, it, and that Indonesia represents one possible um, failing point. After all, the Communist Party is the largest, at that point, the largest non-governing Communist Party in the world. In the world. So for Indonesia to go communist, to fall to the communists, which is what Washington believed would happen, as around July, June and July, they're all talking it as though it's going to happen. It's not a question of uh, whether, it's well, when. Um, and so if that's their worldview, then uh, it really certainly counts for a lot. It, 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 it was a kind of a wonderful opportunity that could not be missed. And likewise, I guess within Indonesia, you have by 1965 a fundamental difference of opinion, but let's say left and right a fundamental dis disagreement about how the world should be, what the country should be like. Um, and into that, the United States and the United Kingdom step with offers of weapons and, and, and encouragement to kill. I, I have a question for, well, about the earlier comments about the difficulty of talking about 65 in Indonesia. Uh, I mean, I don't understand that because I've been in Indonesia at occasions where former victims are gathering and the families and things like that. And even in get-togethers like that, I, I have experienced two disturbances. <laughs> uh, people who are against speaking about all these, telling stories about all these things. What I don't understand, why, why is the, there such a phobia? <laughs> why is there such a fear? <laughs> I mean, and all the facts are there, families are gathered who said, oh yeah, my, 
uncle came back from uh, whatever <laughs> and told the stories and, and people in the community became uncomfortable. I don't know why. Mm. And some of the, those who organize these events uh, became afraid <laughs> that they organize it. I mean, I don't understand. Could you explain that? Could you explain that? Yeah, or I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was hoping you could. Um, yeah. One thing I would just point out, I mean, perhaps some obvious sort of answers emerge, but one thing is there are about um, 40 or 50,000 babinsa. Yeah. These are army, lower level army off, uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. Usually like a private corporal uh, stationed in pretty much every village mm -hmm. throughout the country. And above them is the Koran mill. Mm -hmm. And so you have ultimately hundreds of thousands of people within this territorial command of the army and they have no purpose, right? <laughs> They, it, they're superfluous. And the only thing that they know that they're supposed to do is the same thing from 1965. And so anytime something that the PKI comes up with, anytime the issue comes up, they just go to it and break it up. And, and so you have all these people with, that are really underemployed, uh, army personnel, and this is what they've been trained to do for decades. And they, they, they they, they can't tell the difference between what's a kind of academic discussion and it's perfectly okay to have and which many people would support. And so, so that's, I mean, that's one thing going on. I mean, of course, there's many other so things. So, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I agree with that. And, but I think that there are yeah. many, yeah. many reasons for mm -hmm. this. And one of them is, as I was alluding to it in my talk, uh, this, this um, story, uh, the story about the PKI being treacherous and evil and um, uh, fundamentally bad uh, and responsible for the trauma that the country suffered. Uh, this is a story that's been repeated for more than half a century. Um, and I think we can easily underestimate, you may think, oh, it's just a story. But if you, if you, go th if you have three generations who have gone to school and who have listened endlessly to speeches and, and, and so on, uh, reinforcing this point, and who are aware that not always, but from time to time, when people have spoken out, or not just about the PKI per se, but spoken out on behalf of the landless or on behalf of workers, they could immediately find themselves being disappeared, being detained, being tortured, and so on. It's enough to make people extremely nervous and anxious, even if they're not consciously thinking, well, if I do this, then this will happen. There's an element of kind of, uh, a, a, kind of a, a deep memory of this fear. And I would say one of the single most important feature, factors in, in developing that was this uh, propaganda film that the Indonesian authorities um, produced and then released in 1984, I believe, and it became mandatory viewing for all school children every year for 15 years, which is what, in different versions, four or four and a half hours long, which is filled with the most appalling pornographic violence, which depicts the PKI as the aggressors and the army generals as the victims, and then Suharto as the hero of the story. A film which elementary school kids have had to watch countless times, so that by the end of their schooling, uh, with no other kind of source of information available, quite apart from any kind of rational understanding of the history, you have a deeply traumatized population. And I think that may be a large part of the explanation, in addition to the institutional one that John's talking about. The reason I ask, uh, let me just add a little bit more. Uh, I was just there in Sumba, for example, and in Sumba, uh, at least on campus where I was, people read th that book, uh, Forbidden Memories, Memory to Lara. And some of those people in Sumba 
have told me in church <laughs> that, oh yeah, my uncle uh, was uh, one day didn't, uh, didn't come home and suddenly they found his body you know, on, on the beach and things like that. So they were able to talk about what happened, but to get an organized group to discuss it. Okay, uh, Komla Sam has all these things. Uh, what should you do? And it's very difficult to talk about that. What? I don't understand that. Please, sir. Um, well, when one can empathize with the tragedy of this genocide, I'm wondering if it's a matter of perspective, because I'm, I'm from Malaysia, and um, I lived through this period when uh, you know all this was happening, and um, in 63, Malay uh, Indonesia, Sukarno's government had made incursions into Malaysian territory, hence starting confrontasi, or confrontation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some soldiers were killed, and, has, and so of course there was a the great concern from the Malaysian government uh, that the, which was having its own issues dealing with the MCP, Malayan mm -hmm. Communist Party, uh, that they would link up with PKI. Uh, I remember seeing propaganda posters uh, around the streets of uh, Sukarno shaking hands with Mao. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I have to tell you, it was with great sense of relief when finally in 1966, uh, Suharto had overthrown Sukarno. And um, of course, we, we didn't foresee that you know, this whole genocide would be happening right after. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, the confrontasi aspect of this story is, is sometimes forgotten. And it certainly is. Uh, it's an extremely important one, in part because of what it, how, what it explains about British motivations, because mm. the British were very much involved in trying to counter uh, Sukarno and support Malaysia yep. in the Confrontasi, and as a result of which they had a pretty well-developed military presence uh, there, and including a psychological warfare uh, operation, which linked up with the Malaysians and also with the Indonesians on the army side. And it was because of those linkages, m moderated by the British, that they were in such a, a good position right afterwards, both to influence opinion in Malaysia, but also then to uh, develop a kind of anti-communist campaign um, in the worldwide media. immediately after 1965, after October 1965. But, yeah. Please. You know, after the Korean War in 1950s, don't you think that the U.S. and England have some kind of fear experience and they think that it might happen in Southeast Asia and in Vietnam? That's why they react. We rather be proactive than reactive like killing the same thing. Half million people died there and half million Chinese, including, you know, Mao Zedong's son. So I think you're proactive in that way, don't you think so? Well, certainly, I think that explains, that, that accurately <laughs> reflects their thinking. Um, whether it was the, the best way to deal with the situation is, is a more open historical question. But you've, I think, enca encapsulated there the logic of, of the time. Yes. Okay. In the back. Oh, sorry, John wants to say something. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, look, we have to understand that there's a difference between repressing the PKI, which is a party of unarmed civilians, and massacring people, okay? So the party in some areas of Indonesia was repressed without massacres, as in West Java, in Riau, um, and that was entirely possible, and I, could, I can understand that as a sort of political context. What I cannot understand is justifying massacre. Mm -hmm. And that is something that even in 1965 was considered an atrocity. And I think even 2,000 years ago was considered an atrocity. And that, I, I, even as a kind of universal norm, I would even venture to say, uh, not just some sort of Western human rights concept, um, that killing unarmed civilians in large groups um, and burying them in mass graves and disappearing them, that is just something that cannot be excused. I would, I would have to, have to score. Yeah. Um, so, 
I know I know a lot of the questions around the killings and about the West and everything, it's about the silence and to what you know, collusion, things like that. But I'm also curious about, as you said, the BKI, this is the largest non-governing governing organizations, was like two to three million potential members at the time. Why then were Soviets, China, French communists, like, has anyone ever like uh, or maybe I am. I maybe I don't well enough. But like, has anyone thought about like why was there silence on this? Like, it seems to be this is a very strange situation where you have these two massive international, like this one conflict between two different sides. That at least one of them would jump on this, and no one did. So like, to me, like it's really very, so very I, I, odd and unique about this total silence on this. I think, and there's I, I can give you a partial answer to that question. Um, and, and this is the part that explains the Soviet silence, uh, the silence of Soviets and all those in the Soviet sphere. So, and it has to do with the Sino-Soviet split, um, so that by, at, at the, at a, by about 1963, um, it was clear that the Soviets and, and China were pursuing very different mm -hmm. um, paths, and there was competition between them. And in, and in the case of the PKI, Although there were some who remained sympathetic to the Soviet line, increasingly Idit and Sukarno himself were moving in the direction of Mao. One interpretation of the Soviet silence is that the PKI got what was coming. That had they followed the correct line and not gone off with this renegade Mao, ah. uh, they, if they had followed, stuck with the Soviets, they would have been okay. Uh, and so it was a kind of uh, uh, you know, r really an act of, of, uh, of um, punishment in a way, saying, well, you know, you abandoned us and we, we, we were not interested. It wasn't six months before the Soviets and the East Germans began to negotiate with Suharto to make sure that their arms supply deals and their business deals and their loans and so on were uh, continued. So as far as the Soviets and the East Germans and others were concerned, what mattered, first of all, that the, the PKI had, had gone the wrong route, and secondly, now there was a new dispensation and we better not disrupt uh, these lucrative deals that we have with them. As far as, I mean, China is a little harder to understand, and this may explain in part why of all the parties in the, in the, in the world, it was only China that did anything whatsoever. In addition to uh, evacuating a few thousand, maybe several thousand Chinese, um, they actually provided you know, a, a place to live for many uh, Indonesian communists living, lived in exile for China for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Not all of them very happily. Uh, ultimately, the, the vast majority of them tried to, Went to France. Go, go home <laughs> or go to France or go somewhere else. But they did that. And there were <coughs> occasions in late 1965 and early 1966 when the Chinese authorities did protest, although admittedly it was mostly when attacks were made on Chinese uh, properties or on the Chinese embassy. But still, there was some reaction. Um, I, as I said, I don't, I don't really know what explains the, the, the failure of the French communists, except perhaps they were just listening to Moscow. Uh, sorry, I just want to get everybody else who has a question first, and then I'll go back to you. Mm. Please, woman in the second row. Um, I, bouncing off the topic of this issue being taboo um, and how up till today, uh, you know, whenever there are gatherings or film screenings about this issue happening, like there are intelligence people who try to take them down and things like that. So you guys as experts on this subject, how long do you think it will take to undo the mindset and this fear, not individually, but collectively, to the point where people can talk openly about it, um, the way people can talk about, let's say, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm gonna take a crack at this. I, I think, yeah, first of all, I think the comparison with the Holocaust is probably going to just cause confusion, because there we have a, it, it, some, a very, different situation where the perpetrators immediately lose power and it's in the context of their loss of power that memory and 
memorialization and reparation and justice and so on take place. Indonesia is a place where 50 years pa have passed and none of what happened after the Holocaust has really happened. So, I mean, even in the case of the Holocaust, memorialization and, and so on didn't happen immediately. But imagine, just sort of a thought experiment, if the Nazis had won and they had remained in power until 1995. And then someone had said, oh, by the way, let's go re revisit the suffering of, the, you know, let's, let's look at the history of the Holocaust. We would be dealing with 50 years of history of the Holocaust, which had been told by Nazis. And that's essentially what we have in the case of Indonesia. So the comparison is, I mean, maybe it, it highlights the problem. I would say that a, um, uh, it, you know, the, the closer parallel is Spain, where in the context of the Civil War, uh, before the Second World War, you had you know, great numbers of leftists, communists killed. It, admittedly, it was a civil war. It wasn't simply a massacre, although many people were killed while they were in detention. Uh, it's now uh, some 70, 80 years since that has happened, and Spain is slowly, finally, at the point of having some public discussion. The exhumation of bodies from mass graves of leftists and communists has begun in the last five years. So I would say, you know, not be, to be too pessimistic about it. It can happen, but I wouldn't expect it to happen for another generation. Chris, to sort of piggyback off of that question, you mentioned at the very beginning the, the idea of judicial accountability. What, what would that look like? In <laughs> <laughs> um, Conceivably, uh, you know, in, in some, uh, some imagined future, it would involve, let's say, a, first of all, a, a truth commission that is empowered to subpoena witnesses and so on and to establish some kind of baseline um, account of what happened. And it may involve something like the formation of either uh, a, a tribunal, maybe a hybrid tribunal like the one in Cambodia or in, in East Timor, possibly a domestic one if in that imagined future the Indonesian judiciary could be, could be judged to be impartial on this question. Um, I think that model of a, a special tribunal of some kind is probably the, I mean, as I said, it's, it's very unlikely, but it's more likely to happen than an internet, a, a, a purely international tribunal like the ones for Rwanda or the former Yugoslavia. I think those international tribunals uh, are, are, you know, I doubt very much that there would be international support for those. But with sufficient pressure, with sufficient resources, both from inside Indonesian civil society and from outside, I can imagine a future in which there's a truth commission that gives rise to a human rights tribunal or a tribunal especially for the crimes of 65. Uh, this program is built as culpability. I like to know where the culpability lies. I don't buy this idea that uh, I was merely, the case of the army, we were just following orders. I don't buy this idea that, uh, that there's somehow, uh, as you presented, that there was the uh, Nazi regime in Germany just disappeared after a short period of time. There was a major world war that was involved, involving millions of of, of soldiers and millions of deaths. And I don't know why, you know, since all, everything that took place here, whether it's an army just following orders or it was just a, uh, a, a ethnic uh, demonization that took place, why uh, somehow uh, we can't say who was culpable here. I mean, when, when, when we had seen it already 30 some, 30 years before. Well, actually, the, I mean, the main point of my book and of my presentation was to say we can identify. Well, please identify. I mean, you, you know, you, you dance <laughs> around the subject and say, well, this came from the uh, embassy of the U.S. or from the U.K. or whatever. Who was, who was behind all this? To, you want names or institutions? No, I mean, yes, well, you institution, have? governments, okay. which... Okay. Didn't, didn't the primary plan. responsibility rests with the leadership 
of the Indonesian Army, which at the time was Major General Suharto, who went on to become the president for 32 years. That's, that's the, the simple version. Broaden the circle a little bit, second most culpable group, the United States government, and particularly its Defense Intelligence Agency, the Central mm -hmm. Intelligence Agency, and the State Department, and all those who worked for it at that time. Thirdly, the, the government of the United Kingdom, and particularly its defense establishment and the, and the propaganda office in Singapore that was set up and that organized the Cyborg campaign. Um, you know, if you go back and circle back around to the Indonesian army, it's, all, it's not Suharto alone. He was a, certainly a crucial figure. But Suharto operated together with a number of other senior army officials and through the institution of uh, both the existing army structures that, that were there, but also army institutions that he created, special institutions with, soup, with, with extra legal powers, Kopkamtep was one of them. All those who were involved in those institutions became, became culpable as well. I would say, you know, if we want to go even further, there were certain academics, uh, Western academics, journalists, uh, you know, James Reston comes to mind, um, who, uh, who, you know, by some definition could be included uh, among the culpable. So I, I don't want to, I'm sorry if I left the impression uh, that uh, I thought it was okay or that it was unclear or that people were just following orders. I think the point is that, well, admittedly, some people will say that they were just following orders and some people very far down the chain of command may actually have felt that that was what was going on. But that doesn't change the fact that there were, and this is really my central argument, that these things don't just happen. They have to be organized and they have to be led and it involves the use of language, the organization of resources, it involves planning. And the people and the institution best place to do that in the Indonesian case was the army, and the army leadership in particular. So, the only thing I'd add to that would be that if you look at the people who didn't follow orders, there were within the army officers who were more loyal to Sukarno, and the variation. I think you, you address this um, in your book that some of the variation that one finds in the pattern of the killing across the country uh, is due to this fact that there are some army officers who don't want to have the killings take place in their area. And they, they buck the trend and they say, we can organize the repression of the PKI here, but we don't need massacres. And these are people who are loyal to Sukarno. And Sukarno is saying at the same time, in late 65, early 66, he's telling everybody who will listen, yeah. and anyone who will listen, don't kill. You don't need to kill. Please don't kill. So that's what I was saying about how Sarwo Eddy, who would be one of those f fellows uh, along with Su Suharto, who's responsible, yeah. who's culpable, um, is that you know he had to get those orders, really force those orders on people who were reluctant to do it. It may be worth adding that among those who bucked the trend, who resisted, so in, in particular the case, the case I know fairly well is, is Bali, mm -hmm. where the Communist Party was very strong, yep. where there was certainly a lot of tension over land reform <coughs> between the Communist Party and its opponents, and yet the killing didn't start for two months. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a story that this was somehow, that the killing happened spontaneously because people were so angry at the PKI, simply doesn't add up. What happened in those two months was that the regional military commander and the governor both said, no, we're not going to do this, because they were loyalists. They were Sukarno loyalists. They were left nationalists. It was only after the governor and the regional military commander on Bali were removed and probably executed and replaced by central government troops that the killing began. So w you see a clear, I mean, Here's the problem with not obeying orders, is that you might get removed and, and executed. But uh, John is right that the, if, if, in, if, in understanding the variation, you, the, the w one way to understand and explain the variation, why it happens in some places and not in others, why it happens sooner in some places and later in others, has a great deal to do with, well, choices made 
by regional military and local military commanders who either go along with the plan, as they did in Aceh, or don't go along with the plan, as they initially tried not to do in Bali and in West Java and in, in a number of other places as well. And it's Sarwo Eddy's troops who get sent to Bali right. to do what they did in Central Java. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. clearly the Central Army leadership, it's with the Bali case, that you clearly see Suharto's group is saying, the, you know, the Arabic Ade killed people in Central Java, let's send them to Bali right. and do the same. And then notably, if you go all the way to Flores, to the mm -hmm. far eastern end yep. of the archipelago, right. the killing doesn't start until February of 1966. So a full five months passes before the spontaneous anger of the masses somehow is, is ignited. And the reason, again, is that locally and regionally, you have commanders who are just not that interested in carrying out mass killings. Mm -hmm. And it takes five months, once everything's been cleaned up in Java and Bali and so on, before a central uh, army officer comes and says, okay, now let's do Flores. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly, there's a kind of a sequence that has to do with the tipping of the balance and the, uh, and, and the, the arrival in town of somebody from the central command. So, I, I, I think it's just been so interesting and enriching that we're going to call it the day. And, um, <laughs> uh, unless anybody else has, has something else to say, I just want to thank you both so much. I mean, it's just wonderfully granular and rich in every way. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.